So first we want to see, is anybody in need of a sign language interpreter? Then you're off duty. Yeah, <laughs> I love when you make us network. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And see how many times I can trip over these cords and unplug everything. Because I'm good at that. Hi, I'm Lynette Eklund. Hello. Hello. For those of you that are looking for somebody cool, you got a soccer mom instead. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the first things I have to, to square up with people is not everybody that does cool job looks cool. <laughs> Um, so I'll try not to talk too fast, but I've actually got probably about an hour and 15 minutes of show, so I might skip a couple of things along the way. Um, so first, I'm going to put my shameless plug at the beginning. Um, I have a, down in my booth, I have a coloring book. I drew the pictures for it, and it's got stories in it that are some of the, how I worked on some films, that sort of stuff. There's only a couple of those that are here that are actually in, that are in the book that are here today, so it's a whole different story, so it's not redundant. Um, but I did that because I basically wear a cloak of invisibility to work, so everybody knows my work, but nobody knows who I am. So, hence, my coloring books are Lynetic with who? <laughs> so, let's just start with a little video. Let me see how I push, how do I push play? You should just be able to click in the middle of the screen. Okay. I should. There we go. There's no sound. Stop that. Let me see. Okay. There's no sound. Is the volume up on your computer? Yeah. Let me see if it's run through. Videos are not near as much fun without sound. <laughs> It's the line that starts with those, the smiling and the who's and the ahs, and then there's the running and the screaming and the, isn't that the way it goes? Try now. Nope. Nope. Not a thing. You're going to. Here, there's the view. Oh, now it's fine. Sorry about that. So once upon a time there were three pairs. No, I don't have volume either. <laughs> it's getting worse, people. <laughs> okay, last night after walking around in the lobby, I ended up with the weirdest dreams because you people. <laughs> Every one of them, I was like, no matter how much I woke up and went back to sleep, I ended up with more animals in my dreams. <laughs> and there were lions and snow tigers, and there, was, there were lionesses, and they had all gotten, they were loose in Indiana. <laughs> they were not out of a zoo, they were actually wild animals. And then I ended up with another dream where the lady I brought to be my table assistant was a director, and I had to audition for her. 
and I had to audition in a furry suit to do a song and dance number. And as I'm getting ready to put the head on the suit, they said, well, this suit does have some good, some bad luck with it. I'm not sure if you want to wear it, because the last person who wore it died. <laughs> and this was my dream last night, people. Try that. OK, let's try it. Oh, man. That's what I did, yeah. I turned the volume in here up because it's HDMI. It should be doing everything. Does that thing work? Try again. Nope. Keep guessing. Full volume. I would note that a, not in this room, but a previous panel with the same projector set up ended up just having a hold of the mic near the computer speakers. Mm -hmm. The problem is with HDMI, it, it thinks it, it's playing, so. It sucked yeah. the sound it out of my route. computer. Let me try it. Yeah, it won't route the audio. Better than nothing. That'll make it really stinky for me to narrate as we go. Then. Yeah, I'll try it again. <laughs> Because I hope you guys aren't planning on watching the movie because what you're really watching is like 15 bits of movies. <laughs> <laughs> we might just get it out of that. Sorry. Um, on it was um, Bill Bryant, who did the Ghostbusters Marshmallow Man. And so we had to build these 60-foot shoes. We built them just like in a warehouse in, in uh, California. And then we were had to take them to the Las Vegas Strip so that they could puppeteer them by crane. <laughs> the problem is, once we got them built, because we built them full, like this, well, this is what they asked for, was a pair of tennis shoes. Then they said, oh, by the time they put them on the truck bed, they're too tall to go under the wire, so you're going to have to decap decapitate it. They weren't made to be decapitated people, so we had to cut, cut them in half, ship them into Vegas, or assemble them, film it, cut them back in half, take them back to the studios, reassemble them so they could finish shooting. So the moral of the story here is don't ever trust the producer. <laughs> because they don't know what they want until after they've had you build it, and then you get surprises. So this is then a clip from it. So this is the giant tennis shoes on the Las Vegas Strip. So now we're going to go to something darker. I don't know if you're going to get to hear this or whether I'm just going to pierce your ears with feedback. Okay, 
studios and they called me and asked me if I could come in and work for them and I said oh my gosh I have been dying to work for you guys and they said well we need this suit built in about we have to the mechanics are built we have to finish it in about three weeks and I said but I have a job that's one week longer it's one week yet and I was working on common writer characters and I said, so I can't come, but I said, I would meet you at Denny's or anywhere just to show you my portfolio because please, I've been trying to get to you guys for years. She said, don't worry, we'll wait for you. <laughs> so sight unseen, without an interview, without seeing a portfolio, Stanford Studios hired me. So I walked in the door, and at that point, they had about two, two and a half weeks left, and they said, so we have, I walk in the door, and there's this carbon fiber torso it goes from neck to the tip of the tail, and it's 13 feet long, and it's laying there in one solid, basically rigid piece. They said, we have two and a half weeks to turn this into a suit. I said, okay, um, where would you like me to start? They said, I was hoping you would tell us. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so these people, I mean, God bless them, because they had, they had never met me, they had not seen my portfolio, they had waited for me, and they basically just said, here's your crew, here's the person, this person will help you, this person will help you, this person will tell them what to do. And they turned me loose blind faith to turn the Cathogen, which is my favorite monster. If you have not seen this movie and you like monster movies, please see it because it is my all-time favorite monster that I've ever built. This is what it looked like under construction in the prey. Um, the one thing I will say is I am not responsible for the CGI work at the end of the movie. <laughs> where they turned this beautiful creature into Attack of the Killer cartoon. But then once it was done, you had this. And he is gorgeous. Now this is a man in a suit, and as big as it is, he is on hand stilts, and he is on toe stilts. The suit weighed about 60-70 pounds because it had a full mechanical head. Part of the time, and he was under his own steam. He could actually walk and move under his own steam with us puppeteering the tail and basically playing push me, pull you, drag you around the floor. Part of the time, he had to go by pedal in this thing. And so then we would hook a cable to the back to help him rear up, but he actually was able to go by pedal. This thing also went by pedal, and it was intimidating. <laughs> now, for those of you that, who haven't seen this before, I would like to show you that video again because this beautiful creature. Um, I'm not giving too much away, really, because it's more about how they got to the end. At the end of the thing, we lit that sucker on fire. Oh. He burnt up, and when we when they yelled cut, we took a fire extinguisher to him, put him out, and took him out and put him in the dumpster at the studios. Oh. So, in honor of the the death of my favorite creature, let's watch him kill somebody again. <laughs> No sound, it'll make it easy for me to talk over. So we'll just play it by mute. 
they actually reproduced the entire of the National History Museum main display room in the Chicago Museum of Natural History for this creature to be in. We, we spent the entire time in raincoats because the sprinkler system was going off on the hook. But it was amazing because if you've ever been to the Museum of, of Natural History here in Chicago, it's, they did a beautiful job of duplicating it. Now after that scary thing, let's go for something really scary. lives on and on and on and I'm so thrilled because I love this movie. Um, I ended up building um, not only the, 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 this was the big beast, your typical party horse, you know, birthday party horse, <laughs> except that this guy was on jack, was stilted up on jack legs and they hated each other by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and so this guy would fart in the suit just to make him mad because there was no way out. More than once, I can tell you. They really did not get along. But this is this was for the big dog. Now he had this was a based on a child's per imagination of what a monster was, so it didn't have to look so real. But then we also ended up having to build pieces to duplicate the real dog. So so we had the big monster dog pieces, but then there was also this and this to match the the real dog for scenes that couldn't be done with the real dog because there was no way that they could make that beautiful dog act rabbit. <laughs> so this is a little clip from one, what it was when it was duplicating the real dog.
And then for Sandlot 2, it, unbeknownst to me, I worked on it too because all they did was take the real dog pieces from this one and the insert pieces and repaint them for the new dog and use them again in Sandlot 2. So although I did not get a screen credit, yes, I did work on it. <laughs> now let's go to some bigger monsters. My favorites. Anybody seen this movie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit more than what I got. This is when it's partially built. Um, what they gave me was we were back to the giant carbon fiber Volkswagen again. So, so basically this was all one carbon fiber piece. They essentially gave me a skin, a shell, and then the mechanical mess. And so I cut that, the shell up, turned it mobile. This entire thing is suspended. It's basically nothing but elastic with rings. And it was a space mounted off the mechanics by like three points, one, two, and one down here. And then after that, I built muscles for it. Think back to the Cathelga suit. It started out with a shell. And then in order to make the skin move properly, I built muscles over that, so you're basically using the shell like a skeleton and foam for the muscles and then putting the skin over it. It's the same way as you're building a suit. You are the skeleton, you build the muscles, and then you put the fur over it. It's the same process. So I essentially treated this like I was building a suit for the mechanics as opposed to actually building a robot. So after I got the shells on, which built the skeleton, then I went back and did muscles, tendons, etc., so that I could attach the skin to the tendon so that when his arm would twist, the foam would twist and follow the tendons and things and work like anatomy. And that's when you get my babies. <laughs> now, when they first told me that I was going to be working on the Raptors, I was a little disappointed because the Raptors had already been built before for Jurassic Park, and I think, I don't want one that's already been built. I want to do one from scratch. They said, you don't understand, Stephen loves the Raptors and he hated the puppets, so we want to start from scratch and build them over. So the only thing that they kept was the exterior sculpture. The entire thing was record and was redesigned from scratch. And since I was, by that point, kind of known as the R&D person because I managed to make Cathoga survive, um, they wanted me on the Raptors so that I could basically use it as the prototype for all of the other structures and then what was built what we designed for this was then applied to the T-Rexes and the Pachysaurs and all the other big ones as well. So all of the all of the creatures and necks and everything were redesigned based on the, the theories that we developed through the Raptors. And then we got to go to set. Various scenes from the set. Evidence. You can almost see me right down here. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. There I am. That is. I, I, really did, I really did get there. I can tell you, Steven Spielberg is really cool to work with, but he is definitely, he has his vision. He wants it done exactly like that, and he wants it done like that now. You get about three takes, and if you can't get it, he's moving on, he'll figure out someone else to wait in. So, you rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. He would he would have two to three sound stages going simultaneously. And he would come over here and he would direct this one while you were setting up that scene and that scene. So the minute he yelled cut here, he'd move to this stage and start filming that while you went to there. And so he would he could actually keep track and do because he did not like overtime. He wanted people to have time for the families. So you worked an eight hour film day, a really long day when eight and a half hours because he wanted you to have an actual time with your family. And so he was a perfectionist, but also somebody who wanted people to have a life. And that's very rare out there. Usually you sell your soul to the film and you'll be working 80, 90 hours a week. So the fact that he was somebody who actually wanted to keep regular hours was really amazing. And that he could turn out films of the quality that he does on schedule with that kind of a discipline. But to do that, boy, you better be ready to move, because he's, it's like working for a squirrel. He is, he is everywhere, and he says it once, and you better be listening, because he's off again. So now, I'm gonna pause a couple of times in here. So, this will be a lot of fun for you while you're playing with the mic there. You can just guess what I'm gonna do. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let me see if there's any. Oh, there's any chance of me being anywhere. I'll try to point with a shadow. I was supposed to be going to Kauai, instead I ended up in a wheat field in Valencia. California, it's not quite as glamorous. We about froze our, dip, our tails off. You can see tractor lines where they planted the field. I remember how intimidating that seemed when we saw these raptors when you were That was terrifying. That's a tail on a lollipop. There it is again. It was a bicycle. It was basically a piece of aluminum with a bicycle handle on it and a tail. <laughs> okay, now these people, they go running, 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 running. Now, why they're running down a path that already exists, and that's, like, that's another story. It has to do with a crew, of lighting crew, that trampled the field they weren't supposed to be in. <laughs> he is a blast to work with, by the way. He is the character in this film. <laughs> And then they go running, and they go running, and they go running. Wait for it, wait for it, they fall. And they land. On the back lot of Universal. <laughs> Now, in just a minute, we will pause here again, so if you can be ready on the pause there, Chimo. Wait for the pause. No, the pause is just a minute here. Just give me a tap for a pause in just a minute here. Pause. Ah, oh, too late. Ah, oh, he didn't pause. You're a reckless driver. Okay, well, I don't know, let me just... I can't see the fast forward on it. Okay, it's not very far in. Hang tight. Yeah, it does. Luckily, it's not very far in. You'll be able to pull it. Hopefully, this will be worth it to you guys. This is one of those little known secrets. Okay, this was uh, Halloween on the Universal Backlot. And right here behind these palm trees in the pots that you can't see down on the ground is a black doobie teen tarp that is nailed to the front of the psycho house <laughs> that is actually in the scene. <laughs> so yeah, so on Halloween, um, this actually ended up shooting the night after Halloween because we set it up on Halloween night and then they never got to it. So on Halloween night, there was a full moon that year, and I got to play hide and seek in the Psycho House for Halloween. <laughs> oh gosh, I wish I could fast forward. over several nights. This was all very, very weird. It's really hard to, when you start seeing the way stuff is filmed, because it's so broken up in pieces, you have to see the actor. He was standing there yelling at nothing except the camera guy. <laughs> This was 
the first night we were on set, and the first thing I ever saw happen was, was him run into there and run back out. <laughs> <laughs> Polly Hunter is married to the cameraman, so she was standing there watching that. And this is a scene that where that you saw me cuddled up down here on the ground, waiting things. Cut to a different filming day. There were no actors there. And you have... Oh. <laughs> you have a hand puppet. It's actually just a head and hand puppet in two separate paws. And the paws work like hoes. I mean, they were actually stiff metal, so all you could do is this with it. There was no... <laughs> and those paws again were used for this part right here. This is a different day. And you have those same hose that you I'm going to ruin this all for you. <laughs> what you have is Chris on the other side going. I don't want to be coming to another one of these like sad stories that I don't even know if Stephen knows unless he's heard me tell it. Because <laughs> it's one of the make sure you get on set. Hand puppet. Back to a different filming day. That was the first day on set. bodies, two half torsos, a pair of hands, two tails, a pair of feet legs. I mean, there was an inventory to beat the band to make these things. This scene right here. A whole different day. This is a different week, by the way. Not there. And she kills it. Now, what you can't see, because God bless lighting, was we were setting up the shot while Stephen was on another one of the sound stages. Remember how you had to rehearse it ahead of time and have it all set so he could walk in and roll camera? Chris was running back and forth because we knew he was going to be coming over to shoot any minute. And so we got it all in position, and when we laid it on its side like this, it caused one of the hydraulic hoses to blow, and it started leaking hydraulic fluid all over the place. Well, the problem with hydraulic fluid is it actually dissolves film latex. So the whole thing started turning into basically the blob. And so it was so slimy, so we ended up having to paint the slime. Well, well, we cut it open. We had to cut it open, fix the leak, sew it back shut because it's spandex back from latex, glue it back together, and then they painted the slime with makeup, with grease paint, and fixed it. And all we kept thinking was when we were having to raise its head up like this, is please don't raise it any further because you'll be able to see that the entire other side of this head is melted. <laughs> so the whole, and nobody wanted to tell Stephen, right? <laughs> so we come, he comes in and it's do, 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 do. So this day, I don't know if he knows that the other side of the head was slimed. Now he might, but after that was shot, then we told Stan what happened. He quietly whisks the, the raptor back to the shop. They run a new skin and we ended up having to, basically we cut off the skin, if this was the flip side of it, from right down the middle of its head, its whole jaw, down here, and to its belly, and a big patch like this, and we had to basically patch in its skin and match the paint job before it had to shoot again in a couple of days. So it's like, hydraulic fluid, bad. <laughs> So now we go to Beetlejuice. This was a fun film to work on because 
Um, it was scattered all over Hollywood, so various shops did it, which is, like, when you're watching it, there's like a million different art styles, right? Well, that's because they didn't, Tim Burton didn't really care, he didn't want everything to have the same art style. So he was putting it in different shops so that different people with different perspectives, different art styles, different everything, it was very intentional on his part. This was not one where you, he hired a shop to do it. Well, because I freelanced and I knew a lot of people in the industry, I actually ended up working on two different effects because this shop contracted me for one effect and this shop contracted me for another effect, so I ended up working on two of them. This is the first one. Oops, I lie. This is the first one. So, I don't care what it takes. You get the pieces. I'm there now. Oh, wait a minute. What are you going to do? Now this is all done with claymation, if you know what claymation is. Okay, so it was a combination of stop motion, claymation, and replacement heads. They were miniatures about this big. And so that meant that I had to duplicate the fabric for his shirt and for her calico print dress in miniature to scale. So the stupid part of me, and I told this to somebody today, and I hope they're not here, it's going to be a repeat story. Um, that, that first of all, that, that dress is really complicated to do in miniature. I basically made stencils on acetate of each of the individual colors, and then was able to airbrush over it. So because this is actually, those flowers are about this big, because it too was a head about this big. I have one of the Gina Davis heads, not with the sculpture on it, but I have one of her little miniature heads. It's just cool. The guy who did this effect, he has passed away, but on, he was moving from California to Florida, and he stopped by a friend's house in Vegas to visit overnight and then went on. When we got to Florida, he realized that driving claymation oil, oil claymation heads across the desert is a bad idea. By the time he got to Florida, they all melted. So the entire effect historically died on that trip. So really the head that I have is like one of the only ones in existence. Um, but that one, was a, that one was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work though because making that stuff so tiny. So the stupid story, the story is, to show you just how dumb I am, is they gave me her Gina's dress and they gave me Alex's shirt so that I could duplicate them to scale. So I could measure it during the scale. That part's all cool. They were done filming, so they didn't give me one copy. They gave me the whole wardrobe. So I had like six of her dresses and eight of his shirts and that kind of thing. Oh, I did the effect, and when I was done, I gave them up. I gave them back. Well, I don't know why I did that, because they probably threw them away. <laughs> but later on, because I was hanging them in my clothes, I lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and this was done in my bedroom of an apartment. And so I was going to my closet, and I realized I missed one of the shirt sets. So I still had one of the red t-shirts with flannel. I had his outfit. So I held on to it for a little bit, and I thought, eh, nobody's going to believe that that's the real one. I mean, look at it. It's a red t-shirt and a black flannel shirt. Everybody can get that at, you know, Sears. Not thinking about the fact that I actually worked on the effect, which would have validated. It would have given a competitive <laughs> But not having any belief in my own reputation or anything, I gave up on actually trying to preserve them, and I wore them to the shop as work shirts and got full of blue and threw them away. <laughs> So, I have a Gina Davis head. <laughs> so the next other fat act I worked on was this one. This was a little bitty snake puppet. The head fit perfectly in my hand. It was about the size of a softball. And I even did the little miniature curtains back there on the, on the door. And so I got to puppeteer part of it like when it comes between her feet, I was puppeteering that. Well, it wasn't actually between what on the writer's feet. It was a little girl about nine years old so that it could be to scale. So we even miniature the person. And so I literally, I'm just, it's just laying on my arm here and I'm just bringing it like this so, so it's my head and the snake was the size of my arm just laying there cradled in coming in for that shot. This is my hand because naturally, God forbid that there actually still be actresses on the film by then because they'd already wrapped shooting, so Delia wasn't there, so I ended up duplicating the hands. So when the scene rolls, I then the, this puppet, by the way, too, was fully mechanical, and so I was puppeteering the mouth on it when it started talking. Something 
to turn this place into a purpose leading supernatural research center. And I'm using the park. I'll make the presentation. Lydia will bring the ghosts. I'm not bringing the ghosts now. I'm not here. Oh, then can't you do something? Perhaps I'm properly motivated. My hand? Aren't you just leaving the room? You didn't do anything. And that's a little girl with me. <laughs> this one was all shot in the middle of the night. What we did is we all had our day jobs and real shops and stuff. And then we would get together at about 9 o'clock at night and shoot until about 2 in the morning. So we, this was total fraternity house stuff. Like people were showing up in their pajamas and house slippers and we'd order a couple pizzas and film in a warehouse in the middle of the night. And why did we film in the middle of the night? Because that way they wouldn't record airplanes flying over in North Hollywood. Okay, this one we're going to kind of speed through because it's, it's well, I don't know how to speed through. Okay, we're only going to watch part of it because we're running behind technical malfunctions, but also it's, it's going to be great. And I've got other ones I want to show you more. But I will pause it here in a minute and give you a laugh. I don't know how many of you watched like the Puppet Masters and all the, the full moon films. This is one of this is one demonic toy, this is one of those. I was called into Puppeteer to kill her. We were running baby oopsie daisy who I made his wardrobe, isn't it pretty? <laughs> and dang it, I didn't catch it time. Yeah, I did just this is my ear. Um, <laughs> what ended up happening that day was the day I was supposed to go in a puppeteer, we were supposed to kill this actress, and we had the whole set set up and we had it all rehearsed, and then she called and said, I'm sick, I'm not coming. <laughs> so next thing I know, I see the director and the head, the John B. Clerk, they're, they're like, got their heads together, and they're like, <laughs> they start looking at me. <laughs> and next thing I know, they're like, you look just like her. Because at that point, I had brown hair down here and bangs just like her. Next thing I know, they're, they're teasing my hair, which, my God, the person did not know how to do fake teasing, so it took me three days to get my hair combed back out. They put me in a coat, and they were going to have the puppet kill me. The thing is, I was hired to the puppeteer for that day, so I was also the puppeteer. So basically, I killed myself that day. I mean, the, the good old, this is what this is. And then, it got even better, because they decided that I looked enough like her, I did not have to do the stabbing. Somebody else stabbed. That was her in an insert shot. This show is kind of fun if you're into like these these movie movie things. It's not one of necessarily the more well known, but it is a fun one. Okay. That is me, the fake arm, puppeteering the puppet, walking across my own body. <laughs> so I looked it up like her, but the next thing I know, they've got the camera face up, face into me, and I'm laying on the floor like this, with the puppet doing this, while I have a stuck arm laying up right there. And I laid there for the entire rest of that scene. They go ahead and play the entire rest of the scene in that film, and it's me laying dead in that whole scene. <laughs> the glamour of Hollywood. <laughs> But now, you have this kind of stuff, and then you have one that I am so super proud of, Instinct. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie, how many? A couple? Please watch it, I'm so proud of it. Watch it for me. <laughs> you have to watch The Relic, make notes, and Instinct. This is Cuba Gooding Jr. and Anthony Hopkins. And it was really hard for me to not just like insist on showing you guys the movie, because what ended up happening was they, this was for Stanwood's Studios, and 
we did these about the same time we did mouse hunt, so I was working on both films at once. And um, they went to Africa. They, not me, I don't need to go anywhere. I got to Valencia, remember? <laughs> so they went to Africa and they filmed an actual tribe of gorillas. And then they brought back the footage and the photos and they had us match that tribe of gorillas so that they could intercut footage between the live gorillas and the men in suits. One problem, when they started actually storyboarding this out, that it was always the wrong gorilla doing what they needed them to be doing. So it's like, well, we needed to be a female juvenile, and then Silverback did it, you know? So they didn't have any proper footage, so they finally just decided it was too hard to, to match it up and make it the story. So they called that trip to Africa research, and there's not any of the live gorilla footage in this film. Now, if you watch this film, there's like two or three places where you can say, yeah, that's a man in a suit, yeah, that's a puppet. But I, I tell you, it does not look like it is men in suits, and I can tell you it's 100% men in suits. So watch this movie, because it will blow your mind to know that it's all men in suits. Well, men and women, actually. Now, if I can remember how to push play, it'll be more interesting. Thanks, man in suit. Aren't they pretty? Aww. Yes. I did uh, two juvenile males and the silver rat for that one. There was a crew of basically four building the monster or building the muscle suits. Had a fur department. Those suits are all hand tied. Every inch of that fur was hand tied. There was none of it that was NFT yardage, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with NFT because it is like the gem fabric. But uh, no, they actually sat there with little, like these little needle-sized latch hooks and tied into spandex every inch of that fur so that it would move for us really nicely and get the right blending texture. Anybody a blob fan? I've only seen the 58 version. <laughs> <laughs> <I do> both. <laughs> I like them both, actually. Actually, I like the new blob better now that it's aged. <laughs> when it first came out, I was so much a loyalist to the original that I just couldn't even like it even though I worked on it. <laughs> yeah, it's been so long, it feels classic now, too. <laughs> now it is a classic. I was a child when I did this. I'm really only 36 now. Um, this film was the first feature. Uh, okay, my first film ever was Ghoulies 2, Billy and Ghoulies Guy. And that's a whole other story, but it's not in here. So, um, But the blob was the first one, and I, I'd actually quit my day job. Uh, Worlds of Wonder, where I've been doing Teddy Rex and that kind of stuff, and went full time freelance. And the first thing I did was a He Man traveling state show, doing like all sorts of strange critters. Mm -hmm. And then I did, I got hired on Blob. And I'm not quite sure how, 
but I did. So anyway, I was, we went in and there was a whole group of puppeteers. They had a whole bunch of languages. Well, by then, and if you look at the, you can look at the crawl at the end of the film and you'll know I'm not lying. By this point, they had hired, the, they had fired the second unit director. They had fired the guy who had created, that started the blob shop crew. And they had fired the effects supervisor. So if you look in the credits, they're, they're not even listed. They didn't exist. So by then, this was second unit. First unit was behind schedules. They were filming on another stage. So all of a sudden, you had three second unit stages to do the blob effects with no director, no assistant director, and no special effects supervisor. So I, I did, we did have a special effects supervisor. We did not have a DP, a director of photography. So you had a cameraman. And then you had a whole bunch of rookie puppeteers because they weren't paying well, so they had all these amateur puppeteers. And so they decided, okay, we'll put a puppeteer in charge of each one of the stages, and they picked me for one of them. Again, I don't know why. I didn't have a lot of experience, but that's how desperate they were at this point because nobody wanted to work on this film anymore. So they put uh, me, Trey, and Brent, and one in charge of each stage. What they would do is in the morning, they would hand us a storyboard and we would do, we'd go down and set it up. We would divide among ourselves. We had a whole bunch of blobs, a whole bunch of tentacles, a whole bunch of puppeteers, and we'd wheel and deal and go, okay, I need three silk quilts. You need two. Can you get away with one? Okay, that'll work. I need six puppeteers. You need two. Well, I need five. Well, okay, okay, I can get away with five. If you, and we would negotiate out the inventory available. You'd go down to your set. You would set it up, rehearse it, and film a light wedge. That next morning, you would meet with the director, Chuck, and he would watch that and either approve it or disapprove it. And if he approved it, then you'd go down and shoot it for real and get it that. And once you wrapped it, the next day, you would get assigned a new storyboard. And so essentially, the cameraman and me were directing the scenes because there was no other authority on the stage. So it was very odd, very cool. So I can almost call myself a director, but not really. <laughs> they don't call me a director. They didn't even call me a puppeteer. We were called special effects, so that, that way they didn't have to pay residuals on Saturday. Did I push play? And did I mention that the, these blobs were China silk quilts injected with slime? So all day long they would just sweat. The, the China silk, when it got wet, would turn basically translucent, so it looked like it had no form, but it did hold slime into a shape. And it would sweat it through the weave all day long. So by the end of the day, you were saturated in slime because you were puppeteering from underneath, basically milking the silk quilt on your own head. got very good with fashions out of trash bags. <laughs> it got to be a fashion contest to see who could make the best fashions out of trash bags and duct tape to try to stay somewhat dry. <laughs> this is all a miniature that, with them just put in after the fact. The, the set, the back of the chairs were about this big a piece. <laughs> There's me getting really, really wet. <laughs> and you'd be amazed at how heavy that can be. And it doesn't cooperate at all. So when you push here, it only goes just there. It doesn't push all over. So you're like pumping as fast as you can <laughs> to make it look like it's pulsating. <laughs> Okay, now the nerd in me. Yeah. I'm very proud of this. Let's see. Is it play?
找人工作。<笑>
Does that cause any like uh, guild issues? Like where you guys to be credited as an actor or anything like that? You'll find that Hollywood isn't very good at crediting puppeteers and effects people. If you look about of the films that I that I actually worked on, I probably got credit on about a third. Word. Oh, yeah, okay. and, and they, with, especially with like Beetlejuice, um, since that was done around the shops I was working, that particular effect was done with by Ted Ray. He's a stop motion animator, does some amazing stuff. He also was the effects coordinator then on Game of Thrones and all sorts of other stuff, and. Um, so he was filming it. We, we weren't just set building it. At night we were filming it, so he handed over the footage. So since he was not a Screen Actors Guild signatory shop, and he just handled the footage, it was technically a non-union footage put in a union film, so there was no credit required. What? Yeah, back there. Um, what did you work on for, like, Star Tours at Eric? Uh, uh, Star Tours Tokyo Disneyland. I did an uh, Admiral Akbar. The real Admiral Akbar's head is about this big. They gave me a copy of it to duplicate so I could do a hand puppet size. And then I built the hand puppet and then puppeteered in Japanese. So that when you're standing in line at, a tar at uh, Tokyo Disneyland and you know how they'll have like the videos in the queue and the, the guy and Akbar's yelling at the animatronics or whatever, and that's this little puppet I built. At my dealer's den, I have taken that pattern and made a duplicate copy of it. It's for sale at my dealer's den so the table, so you can come and visit my little baby at bar. <laughs> yeah, back there in the back. What was that dog show called? <laughs> it ended up not actually going ahead and being produced, so you're going to look up and find nothing. I think I saw a thing that said Sun It was called Sun Dogs, but it, did, it was a pilot that we ended up... It, it kind of missed the timing because he was ahead of the curve, and then by the time people were interested in it, he didn't want to do it anymore, okay. so um, it just it was one of those things that just kind of missed its boat, and uh, so maybe someday, I mean, we we still have the suits, we've rebuilt a few more characters so that there's more of them, so that it's there in the closet, so it might get its day in the sun, forgive the pun on that one, <laughs> but it, it could still happen someday, but, it's, but right now, as a matter of fact, I'm working with that same producer on three different shows that are going to be web series that so will be accessible to you, and they are free things as well, like these. So there's there's stuff to come. We've been building a lot during COVID. He has been working like a dog. Forget that. Oh, I'm not that one. And so that there is a there's a lot of stuff in the in the fires for him to be able to film. Hopefully next year as as uh, COVID lets filming happen in Hollywood a little bit better. But right now it's really tough to film on a soundstage because they have to do testing twice a week. And if one person shows a positive, they shut down for two weeks. So it's really hard to budget a film right now, so he's just kind of waiting until the smoke clears a little bit. Yeah? Hey, uh, kind of a weird personal question, but since you brought up instinct, um, I, like there's some people that I met on Facebook that work per precisely on uh, mostly eight, eight films. Uh -huh. eight, like I'm part of a Facebook group called uh, Ape Suit Cinema, and among them are Chris Wayless and Misty Roses. Have you ever worked with either of those? Yeah, things? Misty, huh? Yeah. I built one of those. She was, she was one of the Ape Suits I built, yeah. Oh, yeah, the only one I knew of that she was in was, Kong, was Congo. I didn't know she was in Instinct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. time on set. That was, of all the films I've done as far as set time goes, that was my favorite. I was, Gore Verbinski directed it. He's the director of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. I know why Johnny Depp and he wanted to just keep playing together because he is such a blast that basically it's like getting paid to play. <laughs> he loved the mouse puppet and so it was like, oh cool, what else can we have it do? It was an absolute blast to work on that film. But the, I, my hand was up inside the mouse so I was actually puppeteering the mouse and so like, you, okay, you've seen it when the male goes to the baseboard they had an air gun with a, with a giant to scale mail, and they were like, one, two, three, go. And when they would fire that thing off of a pneumatic cylinder, <laughs> if I didn't pull back, I was going to get a nail through my hand because my hand was in that puppet. So when they said, one, two, three, go, it's like the jerk of that mouse pulling back and the nail stopping was actually my hand right behind that nail. It was a very scary scene. <laughs> yeah. Did you work on Zathura? No. Oh, I still didn't see Winston work that I worked on that film. Yeah, that's, but see, that was the thing is, um, it took me a long time to get to work there. Oh. I said, I was like, 
I'd send my resume over there and all my friends would work there and I wouldn't. And then I'd send my resume and all my friends would get to work there and I wouldn't. As it turned out, it was probably a blessing in disguise because while everybody else was busy on, a, on Jurassic Park, the first one, I was running around and taking jobs all over these shops because nobody else was available. And so it actually probably introduced me to more shops by not working there during that major film and then in the long run got to work there as well. So it, it, that turned out to be a really good thing. Um, the biggest flattery I had probably from working at Stans was that several of the department heads had got together and while we were on the mouse hunt set, they, they pulled me aside and they said, we want to talk to Stan about having you take over the fabrication department. And I said, God, that is my dream come true, but please do not because I was getting ready to quit to start a family and I didn't want to be around the fumes and the glue while I was pregnant. So I had to tell them not to have Stan offer me my dream job. And so then by the time my family was old enough and then he passed away. So, but um, I think that as far as I know, I'm the only person that he actually contracted work out to. So even once I wasn't working there anymore, I went back for Jurassic Park 3 as a freelancer and he was letting me in and out of shop. But also Polly, I ended up building the neck for the birds, those birds and stuff at home and taking parts actually out of the shop to home and then taking them back in. And I don't know that he ever allowed anybody else to do that. So I love Stan. I miss him. So, you have another question? Uh, yeah. Um, what's, uh, for like a real research book, like what's the most important thing that you I wish the, the Jurassic World ones would go to practical effects. They did it first, but then they went to CGI. Well, the, 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 part of the reason is because since Tan, Stan passed away, his family owns those those raptors and stuff. And legacy effects is basically all of the people, the, all of us that would have worked for him, they went on to start their own shop called Legacy Effects. They do not own those molds or anything. Stan's family does. Now, they get along, so it's not really that so much, but if you were Stan's family, would you start handing over molds to get worn out and destroyed when it was the last of your father? No. So they're not really that excited about just like handing all that stuff out to get beat up on sets again. So to have that stuff re-sculpted and rebuilt and everything, for this particular case, it is practical. Now, they did loan legacy the molds to like the raptors and stuff so they did polyfoam poles so that when like when the heads are through the cage walls so that and they're coming up to them there was something for the actors to work with other than just a popsicle stick and then they went in and put in the cgi animated things because they were just polyfoam poles so there was some cooperation but i really do think that the films the effects are really good in it but i think that the acting suffers because people are pretending to be scared and i can tell you that the actors on those sets really were scared <laughs> because because those things were working under enough pounds of pressure that they could kill you the, the raptor went off on us one day on set on in the shop when we were working on and building it because we were only about a block and a half from the van nuys airport and so they had they had the radar controls hooked up, but they hadn't put the stops on it yet to stop it from swinging too far left, too far right, that kind of thing. The stops weren't on it, but they had fired. They we fired it up so that we could open the mouth to work on the inside, raise its head back so that we could work on the neck, and we were using it. it so they were going to program it later. Well, then the airport sent a signal that it picked up, <laughs> and it went into a bucking, thrashing frenzy, and it started swinging around and threw its head back, and it cracked its skull and broke its head. So by the time we got it shut down, we had to completely take the skin back off and replace its skull because it had killed itself. <laughs> but it was really scary to, to work with those things because they the T-Rex the knocked people off the scaffoldings. Um, if they bit, they were working under 1,400 pounds per square inch, which I just learned about three days ago is the bite power of a silverback gorilla's bite. <laughs> and they did have dental acrylic teeth, the same thing dentures were made out of. So if it had bit somebody, it could have crushed their hands. So ever after that, when we had the mouth open and working on the inside of the mouth, we would open the mouth, lock it off, wait till it stops from there, lock it off, and then unplug the sucker so it couldn't go <laughs> off. <laughs> no eating of puppets. Anybody else? If you have a question, Anytime I don't have a panel or something else that I'm doing, I will be at the table because I came here to play with you guys, so I am available. Um, please come down and talk to me by coloring books.
I only charge $20. There's, that also did a picture book recently. It was a good, for those of you that are into Halloween pumpkins or fairies or butterflies, I've got a storybook that I just wrote and I had a Disney artist, sculptor, a friend of mine who I could do the line artwork and then I painted it and I've got those down there too and I'll autograph those for the same 20. I had her autograph some so it will come with her autograph in it as well. So anyway, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this. Silver Gato Man, he bought me a coffee. Silver Gato Man, here is the song for thee. He likes to video all the panels at the cons. You should go and watch them whether they are short or long. Silver Gato Man, you video that's not a jibe. All of you go to his YouTube channel and like and subscribe.